Monsieur of Iceland, Sanna Marín, the Prime Minister of Finland, and Katrin Jakobsdóttir, Prime Minister of Iceland. We are going to have like 40 minutes or so to uh, have them to talk together on certain issues which are burning in, on, on the international arena right now, and also questions that involves Iceland and Finland, and of course the Nordic countries, and the situation in, in Europe at the moment. Um, we have now, out of five Nordic uh, uh, countries, three of them are led by women, and, and two of them are here. Matt is busy making a new government in, in Denmark. Uh, as I understand it, this meeting here today with the, those two prime ministers, it's a so-called working meeting, uh, the two prime, minister, prime ministers going over issues, they have to be on sync in, as you say, in the media. But uh, maybe I will start with a question to both of you, maybe Sanna, as you're the guest here, uh, first. It doesn't matter that uh, not just the Nordic countries, uh, but that countries are led by women. Is there a difference in governance with women as prime ministers or presidents? Well, I would say it like that, that of course it matters that there are also women in leadership positions, whether they are prime ministers or leader or companies. We need more, um, uh, more women in powerful positions, uh, also in public and private sector. There are only few of us, I mm -hmm. think, uh, mm -hmm. in, in Europe. And we usually we used to have four women uh, in le led in Nordic countries, also Magdalena Andersson that, that led Sweden, but they had elections, and now Ulf Kristersson is the prime minister of Sweden. Uh, but I think the Nordic countries are showing the way and, and leading the way uh, also in, in gender equality, but we need more women uh, in powerful positions, and also more young people, more, more people in different backgrounds. I think it's always good if you have people from different backgrounds uh, in, in powerful places, not only lead, leading governments, but also in the private sector as well. Mm -hmm. um, does it make a difference? I think that we have, if we have different people uh, together, that makes a difference. Uh, it's not only that, that you have women in charge of the government, but, but if you have people, people from different backgrounds, that makes a difference also to the decisions that we are making. So I think that gives us perspective. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree. I think uh, a diverse background is essential really to have better decisions made at the table, people with different experiences, different backgrounds. They somehow bring together more combined knowledge to the table where decisions are made. Obviously, women are a very important factor because we are 50% of mankind and until just very recently we were just completely underrepresented everywhere. And we still are when it comes to uh, leaders of governments, uh, heads of state, we still are very much underrepresented and then you could really feel it, uh, you, you know, you just feel it so concretely, for example, when we have summits, uh, UN summits, for mm. example, then that we are still a very uh, small minority when mm. it comes to those positions. Nordic countries, you know, on uh Good days, the leaders of, of the Nordic countries phrase it, how nice it is, this cooperation between the Nordic, Nordic countries. Somebody is tearing down the room. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the media. Yeah. They are always <laughs> <They're> like, <laughs> like this. <laughs> but is, it, is the Nordic uh, cooperation a, a, a myth or a fact? Uh, I know you two and, and many others, you know, in the, in the Nordic countries, you are very tuned into which is now called the well-being society. Mm -hmm. Is that something special for the Nordic countries? Is there a unity between the countries, or are you just you know, friends on nice days? Well, well, I think we have many things in common. Uh, of course, the welfare states that we all share, and the well-being economy and, and well-being states are part of our cooperation and very natural part. Mm -hmm. But there are, of course, also differences between the Nordic countries, and we all have our own strengths and our, and our, our weaknesses. And just today, earlier, we were discussing together with Katrin about the problems that we also have in our societies. We have a good 
well-being societies, but we still have problems, for example, when it comes to the mental health of our youth or gender-based violence or, or many things uh, that are problems in our society. And we can also share, and actually we were discussing about the exchange of knowledge about our legislation, what have you done right and correct that we should learn and, and vice versa. So I think there are a lot of possibilities, not only in the uh, traditional fields, but also the new fields. For example, um, uh, online harassment or, or hate speech that are such a huge issues nowadays. So I think we can also learn from each other and, and work together to fight and tackle these problems that we are now facing. I think um, the Nordics not only share uh, a certain ground in the welfare system, I think maybe the biggest single factor that unites the Nordic countries is the fact that they are open democratic states, that it is allowed to criticize the leaders, as we both know very well, <laughs> that we have an open debate in our societies, that we have very strong parliaments in our societies. I think this is also a very important factor, not least because we are seeing democratic backslide, not just uh, in, in countries that are far away, we see it in Europe also. And I think then, this strength of the Nordic countries is maybe more important than it has ever been before, the fact that these are open and democratic societies. Uh, I also want to agree with Sana. I think uh, even though we are close and we are close geographically, we're also close kind of historically and, and culturally, there are many things that we can learn from each other. And I think more cooperation on gender equality and gender-based violence is something that Iceland and Finland are now planning to actually work on. You talked about the well-being economy, and there is something that we can also learn a lot from each other. Uh, and I think uh, there are many opportunities for these two countries, because Icelanders and Finns sometimes experience that, you know, they have something in common, which is the black uh, humor, the cynicism, the sarcasm, which is not shared by the other Nordic countries sometimes. <laughs> and you experience that in, uh, in relation to the Yes. The other countries. Yes. <laughs> and then, you know, the Swedish, they don't always get. No, they don't our get jokes. Our jokes. <laughs> exactly. So I think we have a, a also an opportunity to strengthen not just the Nordic cooperation, but the bilateral relation of Iceland and Finland. But when the Nordic countries are facing the world, let's go to the Ukrainian war now. Mm. Uh, when the Nordic countries are facing the world in, in foreign policy, uh, there has been difference. Finland is not yet inside NATO. Uh, and, 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 and Sweden, uh, but uh, both are in uh, the European Union. Iceland is not, Norway is not. Uh, so uh, interests can be different between the countries. Are the Nordic countries more united? Are they seeking to be united in foreign policies? Or is, is it when, when it comes to foreign policy, is it each for everyone? Well, I think in, in many ways we have the same view about global issues when it comes to the rule of law or the international uh, rule-based order. I think we share the same view uh, in many cases. Of course, you are not a member of, of the European Union. You are mostly welcome, of course, but it's, it's up to you. Finland she always been, points this yeah, out. Always <laughs> this, and I mean it. Uh, but, but of course, Finland and Sweden is now applying for the NATO membership. Uh, two countries are not yet uh, ratified our, our membership application, but of course we hope that that will happen preferably sooner than later, um, and we are now entering NATO. I think that strengthens the whole northern part uh, of Europe, the, the security uh, environment. And for Finland, we share a uh, long border with Russia, so for us this is a crucial issue, and it was obvious when uh, Russia attacked Ukraine, that it also means a change in the Finnish geopolitical uh, and, and political uh, atmosphere. So I think the mentality of the people changed immediately when Russia attacked Ukraine, because we share 1,300 kilometers of border with Russia, and we also have a very difficult history with Russia. We have been in war, war with Russia, and we want to make sure that there is a border, a NATO border uh, in the future that Russia wouldn't uh, cross. So, so I think this is a very important issue for Finland's perspective, for Sweden's perspective, but also from the whole North, 
Nordic perspective because we are the same Arctic region, mm -hmm. we are the same Nordic region, uh, and we want to make sure that, that we can also strengthen NATO as, mm -hmm. as democratic Nordic countries, and, and Finland has uh, very major strengths. We have, uh, unlike Iceland, mm -hmm. uh, you have different strate uh, strategy, but, but we have um, a big uh, army uh, in Finland because of our history and also uh, great strengths uh, when it comes to defending our own country. I think Finland is the uh, number one country when it comes to the people's um, uh, willingness to defend their own countries. We are number one. I think Ukraine are now number two. We are number one, so we have very uh, strong will to defend our own country, and we also have uh, very strong armed forces as well. There is this Finnish word, I don't remember it now. Siso. Siso, yeah. Siso. It means yeah. resilience, for those of you who don't know. Yeah. Resilience. And I actually visited Helsinki just privately, visited Sanomar yeah. in the spring. Uh, it was so nice, Katrin just, <laughs> that just called to me or, or texted me or something. I'm just coming to visit Finland, can we meet? And I was yeah. like, of course, what a nice social visit. Yeah, well, Most this welcome. is, because in Iceland we have a different saying which is called Thatarattast, uh, or to kind of work itself out, <laughs> which is very different from the Finnish. Yeah. And uh, I read in that trip uh, a history of Finland, which I thought was so amazing because this country has such a dramatic history between Sweden and, mm. between, and Russia and different wars fought in different times. And it really, for us here up in the north, kind of very far away from all this, uh, it, it was a very informative history. And I thought during this time in April, you know, because I was just visiting as a private person, I could go to a bar and stuff. And I just listened to the people and talked to them. And, and people, they were all telling me the same story. This changes everything. Yeah. Everything. This really changes the way we think about the world, the way we think about the role of Finland. And it kind of happened mm. just overnight, overnight, overnight during that but there is a Invasion. connection to the past because yeah. the Finnish mentality is to always make decisions that makes your own country as secure as possible. So the former recipe that we have had, mm -hmm. neutrality, yeah. uh, working closely uh, with, with all of our neighbors, of course the Nordic, uh, Nordic perspective is, is always uh, the key, but, but also we have to have uh, good relations with, with mm -hmm. Russians and, and the Russian Federation. Uh, and this changed everything because we always want to maximize our own security because of our history, and that is the the glue that is actually so you think binding. We, so you think that if <coughs> Russia would not have invaded Ukraine, this we discussion about membership of NATO would not be on the. We wouldn't the have the discussion. No. We wouldn't have the discussion in Finland if Russia wouldn't act attacked on Ukraine. But when they did, it changed it overnight. Yeah. Uh, and everybody were kind of talking about yeah. it and this feeling that people simply did not yeah. feel safe. I think formerly only about 20 percent, I'm not even sure was it that high, maybe 10 to 20 percent were in favor of NATO membership and after the war started <coughs> it went like 80 percent almost yeah. immediately. Well, Finland have, have had for decades you know a fine balance in relations with the Soviet Union before and uh, and Putin would, of course, say that now Finland, if, the, if Finland gets to be a member of NATO, that would destabilize the situation. You, on the other hand, would argue it stabilizes the situation in Europe, or what? Well, of course, our interest is to maintain peace uh, mm -hmm. and our focus. I think this uh, Finland entering and joining NATO is an act of peace, so that there wouldn't be a war in Finland ever again. This is the logic and the reason why we're doing that. Uh, and now we're seeing that Russia is attacking its neighboring country. So I think it's very logical that we are seeking um, NATO Art Article 5 to making sure that there is a border that Russia wouldn't enter, that it wouldn't cross. Uh, and this is why we are we're joining NATO. So I think it's an act of peace for Finland to join NATO, not uh, to provoke ev anyone, uh, but to make sure that we are safe also in the future. How far are the discussions with with Turkey and Hungary? Because they have they have had grievances about your membership. Uh, I understand not so that just a few days ago there were some discussions with Turkey. 
Are you uh, optimistic that uh, membership can be a reality before this year is, uh, has ended? Well, first of all, thank you, Iceland, for a quick, quick uh, ratification of, of our membership bit. Um, and we don't know uh, about uh, Hungary's or, or Turkey's um, process, how fast it will be. Viktor Orban, uh, the, the Prime Minister of Hungary, has previously said that they will ratify this year. Uh, but we don't know yet. Uh, they are now looking at their own timetable. And um, Edouan uh, has said all, also out loud publicly that they, hadn't, they haven't had uh, that kind of problems with Finland, but some issues uh, concerning Sweden. So we are now, now discussing and making sure that, that this would probably happen sooner than later. But we don't know. It's up to these two countries, but I hope that they will ratify as soon as possible. I think it's everybody's interest to make sure that Finland and Sweden are entering together and entering as soon as possible. We shouldn't give this leverage or room to any other country like Russia uh, to, to have this time uh, without us being members of NATO. And this, of course, really changes everything, the discussion, the landscape of security mm. in Europe. And what has happened after the invasion has really probably been not what Russia expected. Uh, the fact that Europe has been quite united, mm -hmm. more, uh, more really conversation and discussion and meetings between European leaders than ever before in my time, at least in mm -hmm. office. So it has really been a factor to unite Europe. Both of us, you know, those of us who are outside of EU and within the EU have stood together in uh, most of the sanctions that have been implemented. Iceland has been fully aligned mm. with the EU. So it has really proven to be a unifying factor for Europe. But is Europe doing enough uh, for Ukraine now? Uh, like 70% of uh, the infrastructure, electric infrastructure is crippled <coughs> in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Winter is coming. Um, Russia is still able to export mm -hmm. oil, even to Europe mm -hmm. at this moment. Uh, is Europe doing enough to end this war to support uh, Ukraine? And if this keeps on going like this, the Ukrainians call it terrorist attack from Russia when they attack uh, infrastructure in Ukraine. Mm. Uh, and if any country would uh, bomb uh, electric infrastructure in any other country in Europe, that would be seen as a terrorist attack. Do you see the moment maybe come that NATO would have to consider going into the war? Well, NATO has said very uh, clearly that they are not uh, part of the war. There isn't any NATO troops in, in Ukraine, and I think everybody wants to make sure that the situation don't escalate any further. But I also think that Europe has, made, uh, has done a lot with its partners. Uh, we have had very heavy sanctions, uh, and I think also on time, we were on time when the war started, so we have made many sanction packages. We also have provided help to Ukraine. Uh, for example, Finland, we have delivered, we have decided tent arms package to Ukraine just last week. We decided another one, uh, over, I think over 55 million euros worth of arms uh, to sent to Ukraine. We have also given humanitarian aid, financial aid, uh, taking refugees from Ukraine. So we have done a lot, but is it enough? Uh, no, I don't think so. We are ready to have even more harder sanctions to put on Russia and Finland has always been in favor of all the sanctions that the Commission has proposed, also all the energy sanctions that are difficult uh, to European, many European countries. So I think we should do more. And especially when we look at the future, we should have more strategic autonomy when it comes to defense. Uh, I think it's very good thing that the United States are putting such a lot of effort to Ukraine. They are sending uh, many kind of help, armory, but also financial help to Ukraine. But all, this also shows how weak Europe is. We couldn't manage the situation without the United States. And in the future, we have to make sure that we are stronger and we are also stronger allies and stronger, stronger partners to the United States. So we should do our homework and we should make sure that we are stronger in the future when it comes to defense, but also in other fields, such as, for energy. example, energy, of course, and also technologies, because I think the next 
conflicts, the next uh, big crisis will be uh, concerning new technologies and the know-how of our citizens. And we have to make sure that we are now investing in the knowledge, the know-how and new technologies in Europe. Uh, especially, we cannot be dependent, for example, China or some other uh, authoritarian regime, like we are now uh, dependent on, on energy from Russia. This causes a lot of problems, and we have to make sure that in the future we are more... Um, we, yeah. Well, we I think actually maybe this invasion has brought home a nasty truth to many people, also in Iceland, mm -hmm. because we don't have a military of our own. We do everything we can for Ukraine with financial support, uh, humanitarian aid, and also, of course, by receiving ref Ukrainian refugees. Uh, so we do what we can, but this has actually opened the eyes for many of the importance of uh, having, you know, not to be dependent on other nations when it comes to energy. We are, of course, in a very mm. good position there, but I think it has opened the eyes of many here in Iceland that we need to accelerate the green transition, and that we need to become even less dependent on other countries when it comes to energy. And I absolutely agree with Sana, I think actually there Iceland and Finland have also an opportunity to strengthen our bilateral relations when it comes to new technologies. Mm. Digital sovereignty is maybe a relatively new concept, but I think that is something that we're going to talk a lot more about mm. uh, in the international arena in the next few years, because everything we do is really dependent on digital technologies. Mm. And then, of course, maybe shortly, uh, before we go to other issues, is the Arctic. I mean, the Arctic mm. is a huge issue now, and Finland is, of course, uh, as Iceland, and Finland closer even to the Arctic than Iceland. And you have those long borders with Russia, and Russia has a lot of interest in the Arctic, the longest, uh, the longest uh, borderline with the Arctic. Well, of course, we are already nations, and, and Arctic are part uh, of our, our key priorities, but I want to go step back. Uh, you, you mentioned the self-sufficiency that we should have, and I totally agree. Mm -hmm. When we look at things like energy, food, clean water, mm -hmm. uh, medical supplies, uh, or, or defense, or new technologies, the digital sovereignty that you were talking about, mm -hmm. I think in these key areas, we should have more uh, self-sufficiency and we should be less uh, dependent, especially from authoritarian countries. Mm -hmm. We should build and create a much closer uh, cooperation and network together with democratic countries, mm -hmm. European countries, the states, also Canada, but also the Asian countries, mm -hmm. Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea, India, and others. We should have these trading routes to make sure that we cannot be, or we shouldn't put in a position where somebody could blackmail us, just to say that we don't give you those chips or those semiconductors or, or those key, key uh, factories of your economies and your industries. So we should create much closer uh, cooperation between democratic nations. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, climate change, uh, the COP22 uh, has just ended. Um, last minute agreement about how to support the developing world. Um, in Finland, uh, are, is, are you unified in that the, uh, the more developed countries have to not just help the, the developing countries to uh, uh, hit their aims in, 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 in climate change, but also pay for the damage, for example, from very bad weather and so on, <coughs> like it was discussed in, in, in uh, the last COP22? Well, I think the first thing is that we have to reduce our emissions. We have to reduce our emissions and very fast so that we can tackle and fight climate change. And I think we should keep that 1.5 degree target in our minds and make sure that we are changing our societies. And Finland wants to be climate neutral by 2035. That's very fast compared to many other uh, countries. European Union has a target of becoming climate neutral by 2050. And Finland is 15 years uh, before that, so we have to make sure that we are reducing our emissions. But at another angle, of course, we have to make sure that the poorest nations that are actually taking the heaviest damage right now, we have to make sure that they will cope and that we will also pay for the damages that we have uh, produced because our citizens, uh, of course, also the Nordic citizens, yeah. we are actually 
causing a lot of um, emissions when it comes per capita. Not, we are not a big country, so we are not uh, the ones uh, responsible for the whole change of climate, but we have to make sure that we are still doing our part because our, our uh, people are uh, making emissions and also uh, using a lot of natural resources uh, from, from also outside of our countries. Mm. So we have to make sure that we are doing our part and helping others uh, as well. We are actually looking to Finland what they have been doing when it comes to, for example, the cooperation between the public and private sector, uh, how uh, the industries in our countries can actually cooperate with the governments and parliaments in getting the goals. And Iceland has a goal of becoming carbon neutral no later than 2040. Mm -hmm. And Sanna just asked me, you haven't thought about planting any trees? She asked me earlier. <laughs> and I said, we are planting a lot of trees, you just don't see them. <laughs> and we truly are. And we are faced with the fact that our emissions profile is, you know, all emission profiles are different between different countries. And uh, not only is Iceland uh, a consumption society, uh, which uses a lot of energy and resources, we also have a land that's relatively barren, which actually affects our emission profile. So we do need to plant trees, we do need to restore wetlands, we do need to think about land sequestration. And because you asked about the Arctic, uh, we need to think about the Arctic because everything that happens there is happening at a double or triple pace when it comes to climate. So I think it should be a top priority, and it is a top priority for Iceland to <coughs> keep the Arctic uh, a low tension area as long as possible because it has a very sensitive ecosystem and it would create a new crisis really mm. if we see things happening there which are possible uh, if we see increased tension, increased militarization mm. around the Arctic. And so I think that's something that all of us really, uh, it, it's in the interest of all of us. So the Nordic countries aren't the biggest polluters, but actually we can make a difference yeah. by showing how you transform your, uh, your countries, your societies, your economies in a greener and digital way. And at the same time, create new green jobs, create yeah. new well-being. So we can show to the world that actually uh, when the climate change is the biggest threat that we have, actually fighting climate change is the biggest uh, opportunity that we have to creating new job and new well-being and, and new uh, financial um, well-being. So this is something that we can show to the rest of the world. Having the social dimension exactly. in everything we do when we fight exactly. the Exactly. And the biggest polluters, United States, China, uh, India and others, they can learn that actually when you do uh, climate, mm -hmm. uh, climate solutions, you can also impact the ordinary citizens' lives mm -hmm. in a good way. Mm -hmm. You mentioned before it, it was an important. It was important for Europe, uh, and of course, then for the Nordic countries, to have leadership in technologies and so on, not being uh, dependent on uh, other countries from outside Europe that could maybe blackmail us. Um, the educational shift that happened in Finland, mm -hmm. and many other countries have been looking to Finland in in changing the uh, educational system. And, and uh, can you just briefly go over it? why did Finland take this decision to look at the education system com completely differently? Because we have to educate people to be able to be in the forefront mm -hmm. of the new society, of the internet, of the mm -hmm. uh, information society, and so on. Well, usually when I'm somewhere, I always say. Finland is a small country, but now we are in Iceland. You can't know say that I'm here. But, but we are also, I, all the Nordic countries are small, yeah. and we couldn't cope without uh, putting a lot of investments and money to our um, education systems. We couldn't mm -hmm. compete with, with uh, low salaries or, or weak working conditions. We only uh, can, can actually compete with the know-how and knowledge and the the quality of our people, and that's why we have to invest in education. Uh, and we have invested for decades, but now we're also facing new kind of, of challenges, and we have to make sure that we are on the edge also in the future. And that's why, for example, Finland has this parliamentarian agreement with all the parties that we want to use 4% of our GDP to RD um, research development and innovation uh, funds by 2030 compared to our GDP, so we want to use 4% uh, 
and we cannot do it ourselves. We also need the, the private sector as well. Actually, the public sector is only using one third and the private two thirds. So it's very good that we have this parliamentary view uh, to the future. And we are now implementing, or actually we are making the legislation, the funding uh, to, to the law. So, so we will have this um, very uh, straightforward view on how to do this. So we have to make sure that we are also investing now. We cannot rely that we have made this earlier for decades. We also have to look to the future and make sure that we are now investing in research development, innovations and education. And there we can actually, again, collaborate more closely. And one thing we talked about also, which is really something that we are dealing with and Finland is dealing with also, which is the mental health of young people in our countries. And I think we have to put this into the context of our education and welfare systems. How can we actually uh, somehow relieve the stress that the younger generation is obviously experiencing in our societies. How can we somehow uh, help the younger generation to, to uh, tackle this modern society which seems to be kind of overwhelming to many young people, which we see in, in, in problems connected with mental health. And I think this is also mm. something both countries are dealing with and in a learning process where we can obviously also share a lot of knowledge. Yeah, the time is running away from yes. us. Just in the, at the end, I want to ask you both, what do you think about this? Uh, some people talk about this, this, this political polarization happening mm -hmm. in US, in, in, in Europe, where you have uh, very extreme right wing parties or groups have extreme left wing groups. Uh, is the politics? You are leading a five-party uh, member coalition government. Catherine is leading three. Um, uh, Your job is so much it, easier. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> I just call her in a time of need. <laughs> in Sweden, it has been in the past difficult to form a government because of this issue, polarization. Is this a growing uh, problem in, uh, in European politics? I think it's a problem if we are losing the centrist parties. Uh, Finland has always had coalition governments. There isn't any party that has over 50% majority in parliament and it doesn't seem like our system is going that way either. So we need to work together. And it's always a good thing if you have a possibilities to negotiate between different kind of parties. Now we have a left left-centric uh, government. We have in, in the government, all led by actually women, uh, the social democrats that are the biggest. We have the center party that are in the middle. Uh, then we have the green party, the left party, and also the Swedish speaking people's party uh, in the government. So we are centrist and left uh, government. Um, and But there could also be right-wing uh, government in Finland. Previous there were the center party lead led that government and then there were the coalition party uh, that that is the how, how would you say conservative or right right wing party and, and then they have the true fins uh, mm. also in that government and we don't know what kind of government we will form next i think in finland we are used to have majority governments in sweden there is also have minority uh, governments so they have a different kind of culture in in governing uh, but I think it's always a good thing if you have possibilities to work cross-party uh, in different uh, combinations. I I'm think. I'm sure Katrin is agreeing with well, you. Well, yes. <laughs> it's, it's difficult. I have you always have to negotiate everything. Yes. But I, I think it, for a long, long run, If you run, have a one-party government, you probably just are bringing the problems from the government table into the party table. You know, just look at the UK where you have usually just one party or the, the government, but they are dealing, yeah, mm. and in the US. So probably the problems are the same everywhere. But I think what we are seeing happening in politics is that political discussion has just kind of, it, it, I don't think it's any harder than it was, but because of the new technologies, because of social media, everything happened so much faster than before. Mm -hmm. So people, I think people were very, you know, when we, when we read political history, when I'm reading about the debates in Parliament and the local council in Reykjavik in the mid-20th century, people use very strong words and, and they are really <coughs> fighting 
But in times of social media, when this very harsh uh, discussion goes out there, and everybody is really participating in it, and everybody is locked in their own bubbles and hardly ever meets people outside of their bubbles, it becomes a, a different, it, it becomes a very different reality. And I think one of the things that's challenging for a politician is really to have the debate with the people who disagree with him or her, because uh, in your own bubble, every, everybody agrees with you. And I have seen many politicians saying, this is really all going extremely well and everybody agrees with me. And then they go out there and nobody really agrees with them, <laughs> except their own tiny bubble. And I sometimes have to think, of course, my Facebook bubble isn't really Reality. the Icelandic population. That's just people who like me. <laughs> and so it's not really the real thing. And I think this is something that's affecting political debate. I think so. I don't know what your experience is in the social media politics in Finland. Well, I think social she media... She has some experience. Yeah, she, yeah, she has some experience. <laughs> social media is only a platform. Yeah. I think it's a platform to reach out to, to people, especially younger people. They are, for example, in Instagram. I'm not in TikTok, but I heard that there are many people there. <laughs> I'm not in it because it's Chinese-owned, uh, but and I think we also have to make sure that there isn't any <laughs> any uh, cybersecurity issues when it comes to people our position. Mm -hmm. um, but social media is only a platform. Uh, it's, I think the, the discussions tell us something that is happening in yeah. our society and, yeah. and really worry about the polarization and also the, the hardening of the opinions. And people may not want to see the other point yeah, of view. Exactly. And that's a pity because there's always wisdom in both sides. Mm -hmm. So you should listen, listen more. Mm -hmm. But this is something that worries me, and that's why we were, we're discussing about the hate, hate speech, mm -hmm. how we can uh, affect that, and what kind of legislation we need to give room to different kind of people uh, to participate. Because if there's a lot of hate speech and targeting on, on some individuals, especially usually minorities, women, mm -hmm. uh, people from, from different backgrounds, then it's, um, it tightens the space where you can work. And that's a huge problem to democracies mm -hmm. uh, and to society. So we have to make sure that there is space for everyone to, to be involved, to mm -hmm. make a difference, to, to, to make sure that their voices are heard. So this is a big issue. Yeah. Well, the time is almost over. We are going to try to give a uh, possibility for a few and, uh, questions from the audience. Very short questions. Otherwise, we will stop it. Okay. And you have the microphone here. And please uh, introduce yourself and just very short question. <laughs> My name is Kristin Vala Ragnarsdóttir. I'm a professor here at the University of Iceland in sustainability science. And I'm, I'm one of the promote, initial promoters of the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, which Katrin knows about. I'm very happy that you are comparing notes of what you feel you have done well and, and, and could be better, particularly with uh, reference to um, the post-pandemic situation and, and the issues around uh, peace. But, and the question I'm gonna, going to ask is, how could it ha you know, use the law to help us reach our climate agreements? And with particular reference to criminal law, making ecocide a crime against humanity within the Rome Statute. And I think this is something Katrin uh, uh, has heard about. And a pe Pekka Havisto in your government, whom I know, has also heard about. So what do you think? It can be proposed by one country and immediately the biggest emitters can be taken to court. Thank you. It's a very simple question. <laughs> <laughs> so, please, just briefly. Well, I think uh, the Icelandic constitution does not have anything to say on the environment or the relation of the environment and environmental deterioration with human rights. <coughs> and it is my firm conviction that the Icelandic parliament must tackle that question, that we need to talk about 
the environment and the connection of the environment and the human rights in our constitution because that would have obviously an effect on legislation. Legislation is the next best thing, but I think this should be in the constitution. I don't have that strong uh, position. Yeah. I'm, I'm Catherine, I think you have discussed this uh, even, even more. Uh, we have the climate legislation in Finland that sets clear targets for our climate action. I think the biggest challenge that we have is with the private sector. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the public sector has made its part and also the third sector, sector but actually the key player is uh, the businesses and, and the industry that are private. And our experience is that when you work with the uh, private sector, with the companies and with the businesses and with the industries, you can make the most results. Mm -hmm. And the Finnish industries, for, for, for example, have made their own roadmaps how to become climate neutral. So I think we can really make a difference there, uh, working together. I really believe in cooperation with the private sector. For example, a Swedish company <coughs> called SSAB, uh, they are now creating um, carbon-free steel that ac could actually reduce our emissions 7%, only one factory. So that's a huge amount of, of uh, emission reductions from Finnish perspective. So I think you should work together with the private industries, but we haven't discussed about this kind of legislation changes in our constitution or anything. Okay. One more here. Please introduce yourself. <coughs> okay. Thank you very much. My name is Takanukse. I am uh, from Ethiopia and I am studying here as master's student in geothermal energy. So my question is uh, to both of you. I will take you, di take you directly to Ethiopia from Iceland. Uh, just because my background is from Ethiopia, from Tigray, the particular region where the war is now currently ongoing, and I am a traumatized person. I have no information about my family, my parents, my siblings, my mom, my dad, since the war is erupted. So my question will be, uh, I am following just uh, not only yours, but other people's concern, other politicians' concern. When do you go to protect the lives of Tigrayans? Uh, when do you go further beyond your ex express of concern? You are always showing a concern, a deep concern, grave concern. These words are becoming common. But uh, as a victim, I want to take action because these people are dying, still dying. As I speak here, still they are dying. Uh, so, so, uh, so long, it, more than 500,000 people are dead because of the war, the conflict, so and still ongoing. So uh, when do you take action rather than a concern? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, we are small countries and our way of working is throughout the international community. We have to make sure that we have uh, international rules that everybody follows, and we have to make sure that these rules are abide. Uh, so, so we are working within the international community to fight these, uh, these but you crises. Can press, you can press issues inside. We can, we can of course, press issues uh, within, for example, Human Rights Council that Finland mm -hmm. is now a member of. Mm -hmm. So we will raise these issues, and we are very uh, committed in, in uh, defending human rights, equality, uh, and making sure that everybody has the ability to have a good life. So we have had very constant uh, work on that field. But actually, I, I, of course, met a lot of people from different backgrounds. Just yesterday, I met in my hometown, Tampere, uh, Iranian people that said the same thing. Terrible things are happening in, in Iran. They need the international attention. They need to focus on, on what is happening there. There were Ukrainian people as well saying that we need to focus on Ukraine. I think it's important that we are, we are fighting uh, for our values everywhere that we are, that we are uh, fighting for our values and we are not backing uh, when the world <coughs> is changing. And now we are seeing a geopolitical change and also uh, m many forces that are against our values, democracy, uh, international law, um, human rights, equality, 
uh, all the things that we mm. are uh, mm. Mm. behind. So well, we need to fight for our values. And I agree because, as Anna said, Finland is a small <coughs> country and Iceland is even smaller. But what we have been doing is tr we have been gradually raising our voice in the international arena. Uh, a few years ago, when the US left the Human Rights Council, Iceland decided to say we want to go there. And we actually became a member of the Human Rights Council and we used our voice within that council to really raise several issues. And th this is what we have been trying to do gradually, but surely, to use our voice when it comes to peace, human rights, and democracy, to use it more decisively in the international arena. Now we're taking over the Sotero Council of Europe, where we are going to and really maybe hold the same so values. Sorry, I mean, and, and just one, because we're also taking over the Sotero in the Nordic Council of Ministers, yeah. where we put peace in the center of everything you're talking about. Yeah, uh, time is over, but I think maybe he was pointing out that maybe the focus is on the big issues in Ukraine and so on. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Countries like Ethiopia may, might be forgotten. But there isn't enough focus on Ukraine. I think Ukraine is a key, key issue right now, and it should be. Because <coughs> if Russia would win in Ukraine, then we would only see wars after wars. Then Russia's focus would go uh, to Moldova, it would go to the Western Balkans, it would go maybe also in the Baltic region. So we have to make sure, I think this is a key moment. We have to make sure that Ukraine will win the war with our help. And, and we have to be very firm uh, on this because if we are not now uh, defending our values, if we would say, let there be some kind of peace, just take those parts of Ukraine, then we would only find that in front of us in the future. We will be in again and again in a war situation. In Europe. Thank you. They are busy. I could sit here. I can stay here. I can sit here much much longer. But they have a program to follow. So I will Sana be the time manager with you, Hamid. Yeah. That's true. We have a yeah. program to follow. Sana Marin, Thank you both for coming here to us today. Okay. Thank you.